Hello, NanaCon. Everybody having fun so far? Meeting new people, connecting with good uh, old friends and whatnot. How many people have been here? This is your third NanaCon. Let's see the hands. Nice. Nice. Sounds like uh, we, we've, got a, we've got ourselves a nice tradition going. Um, what I'm about to do, it is my sincere privilege and honor to be here, to be able to uh, introduce these, these guys up here. I'm going to introduce them like y'all don't know who they are. Uh, but we have the handsome Anthony Magnabosco uh, right here. Yeah. Uh, says here, <laughs> he has been learning, studying, conducting, and promoting street epistemology for more than five years and is considered to be one of the leading practitioners of the method. Anthony has performed more than 1,000 on-camera conversations with people about all sorts of beliefs and has uploaded hundreds of examples to his YouTube channel. Also, we have the brilliant Matt Dillahunty. It's in his contract. I have to say the brilliant Matt Dillahunty. You know him, you love him. He is a warrior for skepticism and reason. Uh, his quick wit, uh, charisma, and reason-based arguments have made him a big attraction on the hit internet TV show, The Atheist Experience. I'm sure some of y'all might be familiar with that. And I just want to get right into this because there's, there's so many things. And I think based on what we just discussed, I think we're just going to have a conversation between Anthony and Matt about how to engage uh, non-believers, people who, who don't understand where you're coming from. And I think that's a particular big problem here, right here in the Bible Belt. So... Uh, this is going to just kind of be a free form, and we'll see just, you know, we'll see what happens. Not that I need a mic even in a gym. Turns out you don't have to know anything to be a public speaker. You just have to speak clearly and loudly. Uh, first of all, Anthony is not uh, considered to be at the forefront of street. He is the pinnacle of what everybody is doing and cares about with street epistemology. That's just a fact. Thank you, Matt. And that's why we have so many good discussions. Luckily, I'm on, in South Austin, and he's in San Antonio. Uh, and so he's driven up and done the show and done the podcast. Uh, this is like an awkward space. Like, the audience is... It's like the, we're at a wedding, and everybody showed up on Anthony's side. <laughs> I'll take it. Except for you guys. There's, there's my team. And I don't, I don't know which was better. You're handsome, and I'm brilliant, and I don't... Who wins? Hmm. I'm going to take the handsome. Okay. I'll, I'll go with that. I'll go with that. That's good. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to talk about the different types of tactics that are available to people, not just when you engage with God believers, I think. I mean, we can, we can limit it to that, but the way that I see the street epistemology approach is that you can use it to challenge any, any type of belief claim. But before we get into that, I thought we might just spend a little bit of time talking about uh, how you got into atheism and, more importantly, activism. And then after you answer that, I'll try to answer the same question. Yeah, so for those who don't know, I'll spare you the entire backstory. I was raised primarily Southern Baptist and ended up in the Navy for eight years and uh, then worked in the tech industry. And then one day I lost my job. Uh, and I thought it was God punishing me because when I was active in the church as a teenager, everybody pretty much thought that God wanted me to be a preacher. Uh, a side note, I did a debate with Mike Lacona recently, and people who knew me, a deacon from the Southern Baptist Church I attended, flew down to Texas specifically so that he could get up during the Q&A and basically say, I knew you when you were a teenager, and we all thought that you were going to go on to great things. What happened? And I'm like, I went on to great things. Uh, no, I, I didn't say that. I thought it. I was in a Baptist church and I got to at least talk to them so that now there's a video of somebody kind of backing up my stories so I don't have to keep telling it. Uh, I kind of, I found my way out because when I thought God was punishing me, I, I surrendered and I was like, okay, God, if you want me to be a preacher, I'll do it. And so I spent a long time in prayer and study and spoke to an uncle of mine who was a medical missionary and a number of other ministers. And eventually, um, if you actually study and read the Bible, you, and you're honest, you end up a non-Christian. 
if you study the philosophical issues surrounding whether or not there is a God or if there's likely to be God or what kind of God there is, you end up an atheist, if you're honest, I think. Uh, now, I'm not saying that the people who don't end up there are explicitly dishonest in the sense that they are intentionally deceiving, but I think there's a, there's a problem of being open to follow the evidence where it leads instead of trying to lead the evidence where you want it to go. So I found my way out. Um, I still do Bible studies. For some reason, I can't get away from that. But, uh, and I don't do it for the reasons that I used to. Now I do it so that I can teach other people about all the garbage that's in that book. But I started writing for some online news magazines and then somebody came up to me and said, you know, there's an atheist TV show here in town. And I was like, yeah, I think I heard something about that. Oh, you should watch sometime. Why? Well, why on earth would I want to hang out with a bunch of people who I already agree with? My, mar my audience, the people I want to talk to are the people who still believe the stuff I used to believe. And they said, no, 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 it's a call-in show. And I was like, sold. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was, I've been hosting the show for 14 years this month. Damn. Maybe, maybe even this week. Somebody could look up that first episode, but yeah. Wow. 14 years. That's awesome. Thank you. So my path to atheism, I think, started at a young age. I was about, I think I was in third or fourth grade, and I thought God was made up like Santa. So I told my parents that, and they were really horrified, mainly because I think I'm the oldest, I'm the oldest of three others, and I think they were worried that I might have an influence on them. But they sat me down with a priest and a nun, to explain to me how God was real and Santa was made up, and I just didn't believe it. But I pretended that I believed it because I could tell that it was important to them, and I just went through the motions. And then it came time for confirmation, and I went through it begrudgingly. It was important to my parents. But it wasn't until I started having kids and they started asking the questions of life. Johnny tells me that I'm gonna go to hell because I don't believe a God and that type of thing. That's when it started dawning on me like, these beliefs are important and how we're forming them. And I want to actually do something. I want to try to, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I saw shows like The Atheist Experience and other content people were putting out. And I thought, maybe I'll do a podcast or something. And that's about the time that I discovered Bogosian's book, but there were no examples of people using that technique. And if you were at the workshops this morning, you were exposed to it. I'm going to be giving another talk today, 18 minute talk on street epistemology. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar with it, I'm sorry, but I'll, there will be some references to it. But I started learning that method and kind of getting pretty good at it and putting out content and it started getting noticed, which was really exciting because I had opportunities to hang out with people that I really admire like yourself and be on the show and, and try to expose people to a different way of engaging with believers. How different is it really though? We'll get to that. Yeah, definitely. We could totally get into it. <laughs> In fact, I was going to ask you, um, the question I have here is, how would you describe your engagement style when conversing with believers? I, my engagement style, I guess my preferred way would be street epistemology. But yeah, so some... for me it depends. Uh, uh, I adjust everything to, to the situation. Um, I don't, when I give talks at conventions, they're not written out. There's a rough outline and maybe like I came up with a remark that I thought would be good for a closing and so I keep that in there. And it, my good friend Seth Andrews from The, from the Thinking Atheist, uh, he got pissed because he puts massive amounts of effort into his stuff. There's slideshows and it's fabulous and I can listen to his talks over and over because he has a voice that just melts butter. And he's a wonderful person and brilliant. But he got mad because we, gave, we were in Australia, I gave a talk in Sydney and I didn't really like the response, but we were all gonna do the same talk in three different cities. And I thought, well, this didn't go over very well. So we hopped on a plane and in 20 minutes on the plane, I jotted down the notes for the, the next talk that I was gonna give. And he's like, how, do, how can you do that? And I was like, well, I used to be terrified of public speaking Turns out public speaking is easy if you don't try to pretend you know stuff you don't know. If you are generally being yourself and engaged in sort of honest discussion. Um, and if you don't care that much if people leave not liking you. Because the, uh, the truth is most of the time, uh, people are gonna leave with the same impression they walked in with by and large. And all you're doing is looking to make little cracks. So if I'm engaging with somebody on the TV show, 
I'm not necessarily trying to convince the person that is on the phone with me. I'm trying to make the case that I think should convince them if they weren't on the phone. Because we know that when people make a public profession of what they believe, they're less likely to change their mind. And sometimes if you show them evidence that contradicts their views, they will often double down and just deny this. And they're on the spot and they're on the TV show. And it's very difficult for somebody in that situation to think honestly and critically. I, my favorite calls are not the ones people would expect. It's when anybody says, that's a good point, I'll have to think about that. Great, that's all I ever wanted. And so when I'm on the show, I, I'm playing to everybody else who's watching, who agrees with the person I'm on the phone with, but is not in the position where they are in the spotlight because they can sit back at home, the mirror neurons can kick in and go, wow, that person just said something that I agree with and they look foolish. I don't wanna look foolish and now they have an opportunity to rethink this and move on and change their mind. I don't engage as much in one-on-one -on -one private conversations as you do. Primarily, man, this, this is gonna sound awful. It, it's not a good use of my time. I, I actually agree with you on that point. Because I would much rather have an audience because I'm not going after the one person, I'm going after the thousands that agree. But I have had one-on-one -on -one conversations and they are different from what happens on the show. Um, so, and, and people who know the show, some of them just learned it from clips. So there's a highlight clip of Matt going on a rant or uh, Matt laid the smack down on this stupid theist and then hung up. And I would hope that people who've watched the show over the 14 years realize that that is not representative of what happens most of the time. And I've had phone calls with people that lasted over 45 minutes to the point where the people in the, in the studio, the guests, and everybody who emails is like, why the hell did you not end that call after five minutes? And it's because I'm an optimist. I am gonna keep a conversation going as long as I think there's a likelihood of some sort of progress, make some sort of, of, of a nick in the wall that might make it easier to change their mind later. So I, I really don't know that I have a specific style because it's tailored to each situation. Mm. It is primarily based in the Socratic method because we know that nothing is going to be as convincing to a person as the feeling that they came to a realization on their own. If I just say, you're wrong, well, the wall goes up. But if I ask them to demonstrate that they're right and I expose flaws in their reasoning, that gets through. Regarding the whole camera thing, while I, my preference is to have a one-on-one -on -one talk and not present facts or counter arguments or counter apologetics, because it seems like that does result in a backfire effect, I do also like to record them because it is an efficient use of my time too. Yeah. One of the reasons that I'm up here is because I've decided to record my conversations. Uh, if anyone else did that and had good conversations, you might be up here yourself. So I, while I, I love having conversations for the person that I'm speaking with, it is largely for the audience that's watching that dialogue to learn the method, to see the reaction on the person's face that, that I don't have a good reason for this belief and the foundation that this belief is based on is flawed. That self-discovery is, it's like video gold to see. And nothing sells street epistemology better than to just see it happen, which is why I like to record it. Um, street epistemology is also largely based on the Socratic method. And I remember stumbling across a video of yours, maybe it was like around 2014, 2015, I think you were in Australia at the time, and you were talking about the benefit of the Socratic method, and I was so excited to, to hear that because SE really does heavily draw from that. We should probably, for anybody who doesn't know what the Socratic method is, it's a process of asking questions rather than stating positions so that they lead themselves toward the conclusion. And it doesn't necessarily involve, I know you're wrong, let me come up with a, a, a set of questions that lead you to the realization you're wrong. It's best, which is where I think SE, street epistemology benefits, when it's done in an actual honest conversation of like, it's gonna shock people. I'm not necessarily convinced that there is no God. 
depends on the definition of God and all these other things. So if somebody tells me they believe in a God, um, I'm not starting off with, you're wrong, let me tell you how. I'm starting off with, wow, I'm still unconvinced of that despite pouring more of my life into this than it probably deserves. And yet you're convinced and you seem reasonable, can you convince me? It's really, this is how, to get back to the first question, it's how I found my way out. I was trying to be the best Christian I could be. I was trying to demonstrate that what I believed was real and justified, that there was evidence for it, that there was good reason for it. I wanted to convince my atheist roommate at the time that he was, you know, going to go to hell. So it's how do you convince an atheist? Yeah. And it turns out the best Christian I could be was an atheist. You know what I found though is that whether you go hardcore and you're presenting evidence and counter apologetics or you're taking a softer Socratic street epistemology approach, the motivation behind both of those approaches seems to be the same in that you, you're caring enough to do something. You're, you're finding a style that resonates with you and you're engaging with somebody because you don't want them to be mistaken. You want to help them generally. There are some people that they like criticizing or ridiculing because they, they're entertained by that. Uh, but generally speaking, I think we, many people here may have actually been believers and you probably don't believe it anymore and that journey may have been difficult and you can, you can, you can empathize with the people who are holding beliefs that you once used to. And I think that's usually the driver behind caring enough to actually do something, whether you, you go, like, like, like I said, go the, the hardcore approach or try something a little... A Is little my approach surprised. hardcore? How hardcore am I? Oh, wow, uh, okay. I wouldn't advise you to change a thing, honestly, because of uh, the very reason because what like you said, your, your, your audience is not the guy on the phone. It's the, it's the thousands of people watching that. And maybe that guy will watch his conversation later and possibly change his mind. So no, I think there's, there's, these are just different tools that are available to us depending on the venue that you're in. We're usually engaging in these conversations because we care and we wanna, we wanna help and find the style that works for you. Yeah, if you, if you don't care, if your goal is to show that you're the smarter person or that you're right, stop, you're not helping. Uh, and if anybody has that impression of that that's what we're doing on the show, uh, I'm sorry that it comes off that way. We're fallible, I'm gonna fuck up a lot. I've hung up on people too quickly, I've hung up on them too slowly, I've, I've called people names. Um, and you could put together a really good sample reel that makes me look like a monster from doing the show. And you could also put together, hopefully a longer reel, uh, that shows something different. And so when we talk about like, you know, the hardcore approach or whatever else, I, I have a hard time recalling when it was hardcore, but there's one sticking point about what we said so far where there may be a point of contention. And that is when you talk about not using facts. And because you're focused on asking them questions and, and getting them to realize. But my thing is, Holy crap, if somebody comes up and says something that you have a clear fact that demonstrates it's wrong, how do you restrain from, from saying that? Well, you have to ask yourself, is this person ready for facts? Many people aren't basing their belief on a fact. So before I would tell somebody, there's, there's evidence to show that uh, there's a fossil that shows the link between fish and land animals or something like that don't provide them with any facts unless they confirm that that would affect their confidence in their belief. That would be my advice. So I'm all for giving people facts if they're ready for it. And a big part of street epistemology, I think, is assessing where a person is in their belief to see, do I need to meet them with evidence or do I, meet, do I need to meet them with a few more Socratic questions to figure out what method did they use? And just really quickly, I wanted to pivot back. Um, <clears throat> One of the risks, I think, with the aggressive approach, like your show, is that people will watch it and not realize who your target audience is, and then say, that's the approach I need to use the next time I sit down with my mom. I need to present counter apologetics, I need to present facts, and maybe not the softer, gentler, Socratic approach. So while I understand the benefit of, of and like I said, I, I don't advise you to change anything, but my, my advice is for the people who watch that, 
be discriminative in where you use that approach and what your venue is and what your goals are. I think there's a problem with, so that, first of all, if you, if you went to any other call-in show in the world, you're going to get 30 seconds to make your case, and then they're going to hang up or put you on hold and talk while you're offline. So ours is, is different there, but there's also time pressures there. And as, as a host, I'm sitting there going, okay, are we making progress? Is this a call that is going to wind up being a good thing? How long do we go before we move on to somebody else? But, and so we don't often get to do the disclaimers. Like when I go out and do talks like this, and we have these conversations on tactics, which we've talked about a lot, uh, I don't... On one occasion, I treated my mom as if she was a random person who had emailed me. One time. Because uh, I'd been treating her with kid gloves and everything. She's my mom. Well, I, I don't want to have an argument. I don't want to make the relationship any more strained. And she sent me an email that was from a mother's love. And it was, I just wanted to puke. It was so and Jesus and love and, and I'm sitting there reading it and I was like you know what I've had enough of this I've had enough of being you know everybody in the family show up for Christmas or whatever else and they're all talking about their religion and what their church is doing everything else and I sit it over in the corner and I felt like a hypocrite because I would sit in the corner even after I started doing a TV show I know it'd be like I don't want to stir up waves it's, let's not ruin Christmas and you know pee on the tree or something stupid like that <laughs> So she sent me this and I decided I'm going to reply as if she were just anybody else. And I went through her email line by line and was like, this is a logical fallacy. This is a logical fallacy. This is bullshit. This is awful. This is immoral. Here's this, here's this, here's this. Here's boom, 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 boom. Probably an hour and a half I spent typing responses. And when I got to the last line, I clicked send. No proofreading, no spell checking, nothing. And I went, How'd that work out for you? Yeah, for about five minutes, I sat there and was like, man, I just ended my relationship with my mother. <laughs> and she emailed me back and said, oh, honey, you're just like me. I had all those same concerns, but Jesus fixed it all. <laughs> that was the fun part because it made me realize that my mom's going to love me even when I'm a dick. And... Uh, and that she's not going to change her mind. The worst part was when she said that uh, dad had forbidden her to ever speak to me about this again. That prompted another response, which was, if I didn't already despise your religion, the fact that he can pro prohibit you from doing anything, let alone talking to your own son about anything, would make me chuck it out in a heartbeat, and it's embarrassing that you haven't. That didn't end the relationship either but there's a new kind of normal. And so if people are taking cues from what we do on the show, take all the cues. Take the 15 minutes that I spent with the, the Christian caller on this last episode who was calling for the first time, who was struggling with grief and loss and what about an afterlife and how can you live not knowing that you're gonna meet people again. Take the calls where, the, where people have called in to say that, you know, hey, if I didn't have Jesus, I, I wouldn't even have a reason to get up in the morning. And I talk about how absolutely sad that is that this religion is the only thing you can think of to get up in the morning. These, these are people who, who need help. Yes, you can have the funny calls where, you know, somebody calls in to tell me how to build a device to see ghosts in a river. And, you know, we, we mock. We tend to mock the ideas more than the people. I've, I've stopped calling people names uh, most of the time. I'm, I'm going to slip because there's no way to say that's stupid without him suggesting that you're calling the person that. But, yeah. So I guess my family story, since we're getting into family stories here, was when I first started coming to grips with my atheism, I was using counter apologetics and, and providing facts and ridiculing my family members, which there are a few that still don't talk to me today. And I think that might have been one of the reasons why I was drawn to a different approach, uh, because I do think it, it helps. And while I have had a few SE conversations with family, I, I think it's harder to talk to a family member who knows your background, they know where you stand on these issues, as opposed to a stranger, or maybe even somebody calling the show who has watched hours and hours of your videos. Um, you're somewhat at an, at an advantage, I think, when you're a stranger just interacting with another stranger. But I think the, the SE approach 
uh, is has really helped my relationships. It's helped me as as a person. I feel like I have much more empathy for these believers than I did before. Um, and one of the motivations I think also for recording these is, while it might be difficult to have a, a, an SE based conversation with a family member, I'm secretly hoping that they're watching my videos. And I actually, I know of one who does. He's in a hardcore religion. And he's learning this method. His wife is a believer, they have kids. And he's teaching his kids these questions and they're starting to ask Socratic SE questions. That prompted a question. Yeah. Because I, you know, no offense, we're friends, but I haven't watched everything you've done. And if you've watched everything I've done, you need to go take a walk and listen <laughs> to somebody else. Um, have you engaged on the street with somebody who's like, not just a generic believer, but like a fundamentalist who's incredibly knowledgeable, maybe a preacher, a fundamentalist preacher. Have you, have you tried SE in that situation? I have. In fact, that's, that's one of the major criticisms of SE is, is that most of the examples are walking up to a stranger who was not prepared for the talk and maybe even less prepared to explain what they believe, sure. why and how they're so sure. And every once in a while, I do run into a, 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 a trained apologist, a preacher. But the reasons they give and the method they used are usually no different than the everyday person on the street. It just takes longer to get to that point. They, they've set up a lot more obstacles to get to the foundation. So it just takes longer with trained believers as opposed to somebody on the street. It's you, not more difficult. Do you get a drop in confidence level even from the apologist? <laughs> Here we go. Usually, like a professional believers, th this is what usually they say. There are just so many reasons for my belief, you just can't take away one and have a drop in confidence. What I do there is I say, well, what, what is your go-to when you want to convince somebody that what you believe is true? What do you teach kids? If you, were, if you had 30 minutes to teach a room full of children that your belief is true, what would you lead with? And then that's the one that we talk about. Jeff D suggested something similar when somebody, you know, oh, there's just so many reasons I believe in God. And he's like, just give us your best one. Because if we can show you that the best one is flawed, why do the rest of them matter? Yeah. And certainly they're going to be minimized. Yeah, and in fact, a lot of times what we do in these SE videos and SE conversations, we say, before we go down the road and talk about prophecy, if you were to discover that prophecies were, un, you know, that, that your confidence in prophecies diminished, would it affect your confidence in this belief? Like if we spent an hour and you came around and you're like, yeah, I really can't tell the difference between humans acting out prophecies and prophecies happening by a God, then I'd probably still believe in the God just as much. Don't talk about prophecies, move on to something yeah. else. This is something that I don't ask as often as I should, but everybody should ask this more, and that is, what would change your mind? Because it may be the case that they're at a point where any conversation is a waste of everybody's time. Uh, it may be the, the case that the thing that they think might change their mind I did a debate in Canada uh, against a guy, I think it's John Robinson, but don't hold me to it. But during the debate, I asked him what would change his mind. And essentially his answer was, well, if we found Jesus's tomb and he's in it. And I'm sitting here going, okay, there's 53 things wrong with that. And there's not even 53 words in the answer. Uh, and that's hyperbole, which will destroy the world, by the way, you shouldn't engage in that. But for comedy effect, it's good. First of all, he's presuming that there was a Jesus which I think is questionable, but I'm okay with that. Then he's presuming that Jesus died and was buried in a way where we could potentially find it. How do you verify this? Is there a DNA record of Jesus that we could possibly use? Oh, what if we find a tomb that said, hey, here lies Jesus? Well, that's not a completely uncommon name. I'm pretty sure we can find a tomb with Jesus in there. Uh, so there's basically, the only thing that he suggested would change his mind is something that is impossible to produce. and. You have to point that out immediately to say that you've just now said the nothing will change your mind effectively. There is nothing that is possible that could change your mind. And this is the dirty little secret. Uh, everybody know who Ray Comfort is? Cool. You'll like the show later. And William Lane Craig? Yeah. You, most people would say that Ray is probably at the bottom of the barrel of apologists, but friendly guy and that William Lane Craig is up at the top. And the truth is they have the exact same arguments, Craig's just better at obfuscating them. That's it. He's a, he's a skilled debater and talker. His arguments are no better. What would change their mind? 
Well, Ray is at least honest and says nothing's going to change his mind. You could no more prove to him that God isn't real than you could prove that his wife's not real because he has direct experiential relationship with God. Craig's answer is a lot more convoluted, but it's the same. And so if you're going to have conversations with people, I think one of the, do you care about what's true? Do you care more about whether something's true than whether it's comforting? If you do care about truth, then you next need to figure out how we go about d discerning what is true. And you have to be willing to change your mind if it's clear that you don't have reason to think that your belief is true. If you can't get to that, which I would think would be among the first questions I would ask, because that has to guide the conversation in, this, in, in that fashion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whether, whatever, whatever approach you go with, you usually start with the assumption that a person values truth and that they think it's objective. It doesn't vary whether we're here in Nashville or Texas or whatever. Um, that, that is a starting point and assumption that we make, but we can't always make that assumption. Sometimes you have to go back and like, well, how, how exactly can truth vary from person to person? I've had people say they don't care about truth. Yeah. And that becomes the topic of conversation yep. because the truth is they do. If somebody doesn't value truth and they th or they think it's relative or subjective, don't move on to their belief. You're yeah. wasting your time. You have to first address this larger issue. This is probably the thing I'm, I'm least looking, I'm doing an event with Jordan Peterson in Toronto in a few weeks, like April 13th. And for those who aren't aware, his view of truth is a metaphorical truth. And so I'm sure we're gonna have a conversation about why I don't give a rat's ass about metaphorical truth and how metaphor isn't true. Um, and then we can get on to his God beliefs because he's kind of like the Deepak Chopra of Christianity right now. He gives the most word salad, confused answer. Anyway, well, that has nothing to do with this. I was going to say, so yeah, so if you get past the hurdle of truth and then somebody tells you what they believe and you get down to the root cause of why they believe or they set the bar so high that uh, they say like the tomb of Jesus, but they've, how could you, and I put that burden on them, what evidence would you accept that that would be the tomb of Jesus? I'm not going to start throwing things at them. Let them yeah. tell me what they accept. Usually though, that People, when you start going through that, they realize that it's based on faith. What is your response when you encounter somebody that says faith? Um, I also remember about three years ago, I don't know if you recall this or not, maybe it was four years ago, I went to go see a taping of the Atheist Experience, and it was when you were in the old studio, so it was a while back. And I was sitting there, and you walked in, and you didn't say hi to anybody, but you said, you asked, there were maybe 10 people Thanks. in there. No, well, you had this on in your mind, I think, and you're like, Describe faith in one word. You just yelled it out to the audience. And I yelled out an answer. I don't know if you remember what it was. And then you gave an answer. And I'm, I'm, I don't know if you remember that or not. But regardless, if you could boil the word faith down to one word, what would you, what would you call it? Has it changed? I, I don't know if it's changed. The word that first comes to mind because of of kind of the glib joke on the bumper sticker is gullibility. Uh, that was what you said at the time. That's, uh, that's yeah, okay, cool. So I'm fairly consistent. Um, but I will say that in hindsight, um, I probably, I've probably changed the way I view the I have, it, it relies on faith answer. Uh, because, okay, saying it's gullibility, I mean, that's gonna be accurate a great deal of time, but there's a better way to demonstrate it, which is to say, is there any position that I couldn't accept and just say, oh, I take it on faith. I take it on faith that men are better than women, that whites are better than blacks, that, you know, that racism's okay. I take, I take it on faith. I take it on faith that, uh, you know, hey, my spouse isn't cheating on me. Does that in any way point us to anything that's true? If we're going to have some mechanism to determine what answer is the right answer? Of all the possibilities, some are better than others, but it can't be faith. Because faith is the excuse people give when they don't have a good reason. If you have a good reason, you never say it's faith. If I ask you, hey, why is this pen gonna drop when I let go of it? Oh, well, that's gravity, and I can, you know, and here's the equations, and 9.8 meters per second squared, and blah, 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 blah. Oh, cool. Um, you know, hey, is the earth flat? 
Can we get a big no? Because I'm sick to death of it. And then you ask why, and you can say, oh, well, there's all kinds of ways to actually demonstrate. The Greeks did it years ago by looking at wells. And if you only had two wells, you wouldn't know if it was flat or whatever. Uh, actually, Neil Tyson just gave this example a while ago, but we've had it for ages. Hey, why do you think there's a God? Well, I just take it on faith. And if you have the conversation, you say, hey, why do you believe there's a God? And they start giving you reasons, and you poke holes in the reason, you poke holes. You get them painted into a corner to where they say, well, I just take it on faith. Yeah. It, the, the only thing that bugs me more, well, there's a couple things that bug me more than when they get to on faith. One, one is that, and we talked about it last night, uh, they'll say something like, well, you've hardened your heart, or you're not listening with the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. or All, all of those answers that go down that line is them saying, God told me you're wrong. And so your response would be, how do you know God didn't tell me you're wrong? Because now we're at an impasse. That is, by the way, how we ended up with every denomination in Christianity and every other religion. There's a reason there's a First Baptist Church and a Second Baptist Church, because somebody in the Second Baptist Church, God told them them fuckers in the First Baptist Church were wrong, <laughs> and they started a whole new church. Now, if this is about figuring out the right answer, we got to agree on some method to do it, and I would hope that at least we can agree that appealing to faith or God told me is not going to get us anywhere. There you go. Yeah, and, and so my one word description of the word faith would be unreliable because people do seem to use faith as an epistemology, as a method to conclude that that's true. So wait, years ago, <laughs> I asked everybody in the audience to come up with one word for faith. Mine was gullibility and yours was unreliable. I yelled out unreliable. And now my answer is a long-winded version of unreliable. <laughs> there you go. Hey, The maybe, source of my, my changes. Go. If only you would have asked me a question instead of... Uh, instead of yelling it out. <laughs> I was still honing my SE skills back then. Okay, so somebody says it comes down to faith. Do you, do you give up? When I encounter somebody and they say faith, I ask them what they mean by that word. Define it. Uh, can you explain how you use faith for other things besides concluding that gods are real? And, uh, but I, I don't give up on them. I see that as like you're, you're just so close to helping them discover that they've built their belief in an unreliable foundation. I should probably start by saying, please define what you mean by faith, because it's always an assumption and it's a mistake. As soon as you assume what they mean by faith or God or whatever else, uh, even if you haven't actually been, made a mistake, like people say, how can you do the show all these years? You know, aren't, aren't you tired of saying the same thing over and over again? I tend to make a game of it. I'm, actually, I make several games of it. Um, one is I see how early in the call I can accurately predict what they're going to say. This is just, this is the, the soundtrack of my mind while I'm on the show. And on a couple of occasions, it's been in the first two or three words, and I've nailed it. Uh, but I don't engage in the confirmation bias to think that I can accurately read minds, even though I'll pretend to later. This game, it's not just to keep it interesting for me. It's, it's so that I can learn something, so that I can hone in on pattern recognition. So Jerry DeWitt, who has taken a nap, by the way, uh, he and I had a conversation about how different preachers speak for different denominations. And it's not, it's not a north-south thing, it's not a particular accent thing, it is a style and a cadence. In much the same way that if you're at a Catholic church, you're celebrating the Mass and we're talking about all of this stuff. <laughs> and then you have somebody like Jerry, who's going to be a Pentecostal. By the way, it's Pentecostal, not Pentecostal. Pentecostal, and they, there's a buildup that's gradually more animated. And then you have the Southern Baptist preachers that I grew up with, and they go in this oscillating pattern of, I'm gonna build up, and then I'm gonna come back down here quick, and I'm gonna build back up, and I'm gonna come back down. And all of these things, you can, by the way, don't go down the road of, oh, these are all standard hypnosis techniques. No, 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 don't, don't go down that road the mass delusion that, yes, there's something to music, yes, there's something to speaking in particular cadences, but the curiosity of listening to this is what led me to see if I could figure out, based on the cadence of the person speaking on the phone, if I could tell what denomination they were coming from, along with the words. And it was just a fun game, and now I don't remember what the hell you asked me. <laughs> I don't even remember. Um, Okay, in street epistemology-based conversations, we oftentimes ask a person how sure they are that their belief is true on a scale from zero to 100 or one to 10. And 
we seem to recognize that it's subjective, the person could be lying, but it seems like it's really useful in, in quickly sizing up, like you might listen to a voice pattern or something, to get a number from a priest who says he's 80% sure that God is real can be a really interesting starting point. So I know we've talked a little bit before about the scale. Maybe we yeah. could talk about, w would you be open to, for, I don't know, the next month having the operators at AXP asking people where they are and reporting a confidence scale? So you don't think I should change anything, but you want the call screeners to change. It, I'm, it, I'm messing with you. <laughs> it could be a number that could be passed along to you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm at, first of all, I'm happy to do that. I'll suggest it. I'm on the show less and less because now there's, the once upon a time there was one and I did 50 shows a year. And then there were two and now there's three and I travel more. Um, I'll talk it over with the other hosts and I think it'd be interesting to get the call screener. But this is probably a good point to talk about where I have objections not objections. Street epistemology is awesome. We need as many different approaches as there are approaches that affect people. I'm a fan of ridiculing ideas that are ridiculous, but I don't start there. It's not like somebody calls in and says, hey, I believe in God. And I'm like, well, I believe in, you know, flying fish all around the moon. You know, oh, aren't you silly? Uh, you don't begin there. But if, if somebody's demonstrated a propensity for ideas that are clearly ridiculous, I don't mind going there occasionally, but it's never the starting point. When we're engaging in street epistemology or anything that's roughly like it, that's, the goal, if I'm understanding correctly, is to have an honest conversation where somebody at some point expresses their confidence level in their idea. How confident are you that the earth is not an oblate spheroid? And then you have a conversation, and then you get their confidence level towards the end. More or less. So the, the, the scale is optional. You don't have to do it. Sure. But it does, yeah, it does help but you, you kind of get just a do, sense. Are you more confident, less yeah, confident, exactly. just the same? Here's the thing, and, I, and Anthony's heard this before, and if you guys have watched us discuss this before, my apologies, I'll keep it short. Person walks up, I believe the earth is flat. Cool, What's, how confident are you? 99%. And then you talk to them for 10 minutes, and they're at 80%. Did you lower, did their confidence level lower 19 points? Or were they really at 80% at the beginning, but they were exaggerating a bit? They and, felt they need to express this confidence. And that's a possibility. The other thing is, now they're at 80%. Is there any indication that that's gonna go lower? Because if we're talking about the God thing, the manual for creating atheists, this doesn't necessarily create an atheist because if you're still if you start at 90 percent confidence that there's a god and and anthony you know very velvet glove beats beats you down to 80 percent you're still 80 percent confident that there's a god and what if after we we engage and you get me from 90 percent to 60 percent and then i leave and some guy down at the end of the street asked me if, how confident i am that there's a god Am I still at 60% or did I get back up towards 85, 90% right, right, in that right. walk? Well, that's why I like to look at SE these days as imparting a set of tools. So not only do I want to have a conversation with somebody where I challenge what they believe and have them question and possibly doubt, and yeah, maybe even lower their confidence, but I want them to be so enamored with the conversation that they want to learn the Socratic method of street epistemology. So they keep asking themselves those questions. And if they find better reasons to justify their confidence in a God, I'm okay with that. Oh, I'm, if they have better reasons, I'm not only okay with it, I want to know. Tell me, tell yeah. me. Yeah. You know, this is, you, you got the, I'm going to talk a little bit about skepticism during the magic show, but You've got the James Randi Educational Foundation, who for years had the million dollar prize for anybody who could demonstrate any paranormal thing. Uh, people think that skepticism is about debunking, in part because, you know, Harry Houdini went out and debunked spirit mediums. Uh, oh, that's in the show, too. Damn. So, welcome to the show early. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, there's this perception that this is what skepticism is, is about debunking. It's not. It's about attempting to confirm claims and fairly and honestly acknowledging when they have failed to be confirmed. If you are walking around with a dowsing set of sticks and you think that you can find gold or water or whatever you can divine, and we put that to the test and you fail, have we proven that dowsing doesn't work? No. 
All we've demonstrated is that on this day, in this way, you couldn't produce the effect that you thought you could. Maybe you can do it tomorrow. Maybe you can do it another day. And so that puts us in this position of, well, how many times are we going to have to test dowsing before we can say it's bullshit? Forever. Until some time as somebody demonstrates that it's real, or we can conclusively demonstrate if it, essentially, is it falsifiable? Is there some way to show that this doesn't work? Now, with that realization, does that mean we actually have to spend all of our time testing dowsers? No, and the JREF came up with kind of a solution to this, which is, you know, we've had this challenge for years, nobody's ever demonstrated anything, and so we're gonna set kind of higher standards. It's not just anybody can send in their thing, it's do you have something new and novel, or do you have confirmed reports from reliable sources of you being able to produce this? Because if you can find water or gold and you can do it reliably and you're taking money to do it, certainly at least one of the local papers will write up something to say, yep, Jim finds water 94% of the time. Well, great, now we've got something a little more specific. So you don't have to sit here and, and, and spin your wheels, but you shouldn't reach the conclusion, this is false until it's actually been falsified. And that's got nothing to do with what we're talking about. <laughs> we have about five more minutes, and I wanted to get to this last question here. Okay. So uh, with your approach or my approach or any, anything in between, um, and there's not that much gap in between, it seems, um, I know that people contact you. I've overheard people tell you that you're the reason why they don't believe, and, and people have told me the same. People that I've had conversations with have said that that conversation started me on a journey and I want to thank you for doing that. And it's flattering when I hear that, but I, I want to, I guess I want to ask you how much credit should we be willing to take when somebody discloses that we were instrumental in some way in them abandoning a belief like believing in a God? Virtually none. Um, I used to kind of do polls at some conventions where, and I'm not going to do it here today, uh, because some people view it as kind of self-serving, but the point was to say, the stuff we've done on the shows, the debates and everything else, they've had an impact. So I would, the point was to say, how many people you used to believe, how many of you no longer believe, and how many of you no longer believe because people challenged you on your ideas, whether it's me or somebody else. And that shows that people are worth talking to. Because there's so many people who are like, oh, you can't, you can't reason somebody out of something that they weren't reasoned into it to begin with. Bullshit. First of all, they were reasoned into it. It was just bad reasoning. You are reason every position you hold is the result of reasoning. It's just often flawed reasoning. And so the solution to that is better reasoning. Also, oh well, you know, they're just I had a guy email just last week to tell me that the average IQ of my callers to the show was 85. And I was like, wow, you're an arrogant ass. What's my IQ there, Mr. IQ Whisperer? Because it certainly didn't go up when I gave up my Christian beliefs. I didn't, I didn't my IQ didn't, matter of fact, what we know about IQ is that mine's probably declining. Uh, man, that's terrifying. <laughs> oh, no, it's not, because I don't give a rat's ass what your IQ is. Because IQ is a measure of how good you are at taking IQ tests. It doesn't tell anybody how reasonable, there are brilliant people, people with IQs higher than mine who believe some of the dumbest stuff you'll ever hear. And there are people with incredibly low IQs who are absolutely brilliant at all kinds of things. Get off the IQ bandwagon and stop assuming that somebody believes because they're stupid rather than believing because they've been misinformed because all of us are human and make mistakes. And oh, by the way, they were probably surrounded by everybody in their family telling them the same story, this, this sort of indoctrination thing. When people come up to me at conventions. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, thank you so much. What you did on the show, I, was a, I wasn't a skeptic or I was a fundamentalist or I was this, I was this, I was this, and something you said really changed my life. I give them the same answer almost every single time, which is, you did that. Don't give the credit to me. There's a thousand other people here heard me say the same thing you did and they didn't change their mind. So you should get the credit because you were willing to listen. You were willing to reconsider what your views are. You were willing to follow the evidence instead of sticking in your foregone conclusion. I credit people with, with uh, waking me up to certain ideas. It happens all the time. And what I'm crediting them with is they were the first person who expressed this in a way that made me think about it. 
But I changed my own mind, and I had to be willing to give up my beliefs when they weren't supported by evidence. And damn it, I want credit for that. So when you do it, just because you heard something from me, take credit for it. Own the fact that you have done exactly what you should do as a rational, skeptical human being. Uh, you can still say, you're, you know, hey, I love your show and whatever. That's great. Uh, you can tell me how awesome I am, because that never hurts. But take credit for the fact that you did the hard work. You know how many people are never going to question the crap they've been fed their entire life? You know how, ne how many people never bother to consider the foundations of morality? Oh, this is what God says, because that's the lazy way. I don't have to think about it at all. God says don't murder people. That's why murdering's wrong. No. Murdering people's wrong because it's, wait, what was there? Oh, because they're dead. I'd rather not be dead. Life is preferable to death. I'd rather live in a society where we'd kind of discourage that and look down on people who run around killing people. That wasn't that hard, was it? Oh, well, it's not an objective absolute source. Well, it's close enough. I'd like to keep living, wouldn't you? I'd like people not to steal my stuff. Hey, I'd like people not to spread misinformation about me. You can, you can have an entirely selfish foundation for morality, all about how you want to be in the world. Ah, I'd rather not be stabbed, shot, raped, murdered, stolen from. Cool, so at least, even if I'm completely selfish, I still build a better world than I do by just saying, hey, God said so. And most people will never even take the few minutes it takes to consider that. So if you changed your mind, own that shit. I think that wraps it up. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.